Drop dead, right? Drop dead. That was a killer. That was a, not a good time for our city, right? That was a bad time for our city, but it was uh, something that was, we had to do something because we love New York. We love New York. And that was probably maybe the worst of the worst. And, but I just wanted to do it. I love the building. I love the potential of the building. It was called the Commodore Hotel. It was built in 1909 and it was a mess. And they had a uh, spa and the spa was called Relaxation Plus. And nobody ever got into what the plus meant. You don't want to know. And everybody in the building was failing. Every retail tenant in the building was failing. And I was able to get most of them out. But Relaxation Plus was making an absolute fortune. And I couldn't get them out. And I asked about all sorts of things. I shouldn't say this too loud because I will be really ridiculed by the conservatives, of which I am one. I even said, what about condemnation? But I didn't do that, okay? Is everybody happy I didn't do that? But I ended up getting them out and brought the building down to its steel, except for some of the details on a couple of the ceilings, because they would have been very hard. This is one of the rooms, actually, right here, the detail of the ballroom and the details of the rooms outside. And trying to save those details cost a fortune, because when the whole building was essentially brought down to the steel, we had to put canvas over all of the areas we were saving. And when it rained, that was not an easy situation. But I got it built. And what happened is, as we were opening, the market changed, because the city was doing so badly. And that was the worst that the city had ever been economically, also. Uh, people leaving, companies were leaving in droves. And it was just something of a miracle. Uh, the area, I opened the building to tremendous fanfare, and the area became uh, just special. I mean, special. And I called it a Park Avenue address, even though it really fronted on 42nd Street. I called it Park Avenue. You know, it's on the Park Avenue ramp, in all fairness, right? Might not be pure park. I had a choice of Lexington Avenue, 42nd Street, or Park Avenue. And guess what? I chose Park Avenue. And that wasn't bad, right? Well, I had that also in Columbus Circle. You know, I did the big hotel, Trump International, and it's been a great success from the day it was built. And we're in the circle. And Columbus Circle didn't have a good name, but it also was on Central Park West. But it was called Seven Columbus Circle. And a little known fact, in fact, you know, when we talk about government, we talk about rules and regulations, a little known fact is that when you have an address, at least in New York, when you have an address in a building, it's very, very hard, so hard to change. So when you have a building that's seven Columbus Circle, you have to go through the whole United States government to get because of the mail service and because of the U.S. mail and all of the different problems. So it was seven Columbus, and I basically stripped that one down. We built a tremendous building, but I had to call it seven Columbus Circle. I said, I'm not doing it. And I went out and I really put on a big campaign in Washington, and I got it changed to number one Central Park West. That was good, too. And... You know, I figured the day I got that change, the building was worth about seven times more than I paid for it, right? So anyway, but this has been a, a, just a, an amazing, an amazing event, this building. And I think of it because when I did the building, everybody said, don't do it. It can't be done. It's never going to happen. Bad area, bad location, uh, tremendous crime. The city's dying and the city was dying. It wasn't just like not doing well. The city was dead. And I remember when I said to a friend of mine who was in a different business, a very good business, and he was talking about what I did, I became a friend. I said, well, I'm in the real estate business in New York. And he looked at me and said, oh, that's too bad. That's how bad it was. But it turned out to be a great business, number one, and it turned out to be a great, great success as a hotel. And uh, it was built, and Hyatt was my partner. And we, uh, we did a good job, and uh, it was uh, from, from the time it opened, it was amazing, because from the day it opened, the market changed. And that's happened with a number of jobs. That happened with me with 40 Wall Street. I bought a building, the tallest building in downtown Manhattan, bought it during the Depression, literally the Depression of the early 90s, and paid very little for it. Again, nobody wanted it. And then when I opened, it was like the world had changed, and it became a tremendously successful building, which I still have. So a lot of things happen. But with this one in particular, because when I did it, it was people just didn't want it, especially my father. My father was the man that taught me the most. And 
he loaned me a small amount of money, and I built it into a, a great, great company. And it was, you know, just something I loved. But he was so against me coming into Manhattan. And then uh, this became so successful, and he said, wow. Uh, paid him back the money, did other things. We did the convention center, the Jacob Javits Convention Center. I got uh, the state and the city to build, and to, to this day. They were going to build that one in the water, and they had all sorts of environmental approvals. See, even then, they had environmental approvals. And they had the pierhead bulkhead problems. They had tremendous problems, and they were in the wrong location. I went to Governor Kerry, who was a Democrat, but I want to tell you, he was a great, great problem solver. And they were spending so much money on and wasting it. They couldn't get any approval. And I went to the governor. We had a man, I won't mention his name, but he's very well known. And he was totally against what I was doing. And he just wanted to build it in this one location, which was a bad, you had to go through Hell's Kitchen, and you had to go under the West Side Highway. You had to build ramps over the highway. You had no access. And on top of that, it was being built in the Hudson River, and you couldn't get any approvals. Other than that, it was a wonderful site. And this guy, I won't mention his name. His name was Richard Ravage, was totally, <laughs> New Yorkers know that name. He was so intent on building it. And I was arguing with him and fighting, and I said, look, I have the, an option to the West Side Railroad Yards, and I had it for this purpose. I did it with the Penn Central Company, which was in bankruptcy. And I said, look, this, you don't have to go. It's on the proper side of the West Side Highway. The site is big. The site is great. We went up to Governor Kerry, and Governor Kerry appointed Ravage to head up this commission to build the convention center. And they were just about starting. And I sat down, and I'll never forget it. I sat down with... Governor Hugh Carey and his staff, and he said, Ravage, you make the case for your site. And he made a case for 20 minutes. And every time he talked, it was just wrong, wrong, wrong. He said, Donald, would you make the case? I made the case. It took me five minutes. At the end of five minutes, he says, not even close. Totally changed gears, built it, got the approvals quickly, got it built. It was called the Jacob Javits Convention Center. And to this day, it does great. So we're happy about it. And then I built, you know, many other buildings all over the city. I mean, I'm, I'm just uh, listing some of them. And because this one really was where I started. This was my first. This was my first. The Grand Hyatt Hotel. And then uh, little things like the Woolman Rink. Seven years, the city couldn't fix an ice skating rink. It's probably... I think I became more famous because of the Woolman Rink. They had, for seven years, they couldn't build an ice skating rink. For seven years. And I had my daughter, Ivanka. She was very... Did anybody hear of Ivanka? Anybody? But she was a very young girl. She kept saying, Daddy, Daddy, can't we go ice skating? Year after year, I'd say, you can't. They're building the rink. And finally, I went down, I looked, and I saw 400 men. In those cases, it was all men, I have to say. Today, you have men and women as your construction people, which is great. But it was all men. They had 400 men sitting in the rink, not working. And I came back a half hour later, they still weren't working. They were taking lunch breaks many, many times a day. That Nobody was working. And they went out and they got from Miami Beach a expert on ice. But they meant refrigerators, not to make ice. And I'll never forget, sort of an interesting story. I hope it's interesting, but I got to tell it anyway, because who the hell wants to talk about politics all the time, right? <laughs> this politics gets a little boring. But what happened is I went to the mayor. I said, listen, Mr. Mayor, Ed Koch, I said, it's seven years now. It's going to be eight, nine, ten. They have no idea. They use the thing called Freon, and that's a gas that goes through copper piping, copper tubing. They had six miles of copper. It had a four inches apart, and it was laid this massive rink. It's almost 90,000 square feet. That's like big, big office floors times three. Big spots. You see it. I run it. I've run it for many, many years. It's been such a tremendous place. But... They had the Freon, and it was laid four inches, miles of it. And every time they put this beautiful copper down, every single time, the next night, people would steal it. So they kept putting it down, kept getting sold. Putting it down, kept getting sold. Then they put the police force around, and it was fine. Until the police force decided to go to lunch, it was all stolen. So they were losing millions of dollars. They were actually in for $22 million, and they had nothing. And I went to see Ed Koch, and he said, I'm not going to let you do it. And then I went to see some of the newspapers. I went to the editorial boards. I said, the mayor won't let us do it. I can fix this thing. I'll do it in six months to a year. 
and you're going to be years and years, and they don't know what they're doing, and they're spending a fortune. And I'll never forget, I went to two editorial boards, New York Times, and the other one I won't say, because I don't like the paper. But I do like the New York Post. I do like the New York Post. And they did editorials, that you have to let them do it, you have to let them do it. Anyway, they let me do it. I took over the project, and a lot of people said, well, it was built. It wasn't built. It was, the, the concrete was poured. It was nine inches higher on one side than the other side. So when you poured the water, you had a big swimming pool here, and this one had no, no it was just a mess. And the one was so deep, you couldn't freeze it because it was too much. So I had to rip out the entire slab, and the slab was a foot and a half thick. It only had to be four inches. So we ripped it, and we did. And I finished it in four months. And I said, if it costs any more than $2 million, it's true. Because it's a great government. You know, they study this at the Wharton School. They study it at Harvard because it's the difference maybe between the public sector and the private sector. I went in big, you know, it's really been to this day, it's a great case study. I went in and we did a job like you wouldn't believe. We took out that horrible, big, massive slab of concrete. We leveled it out. But most importantly, I said to the people, What's with this Freon? I hear they're losing millions of dollars of copper tubing all the time. What is it? And I said, who are the people? And they said, well, it's an air conditioning firm from Miami. I said, from Miami? What do we, I don't want ice from Miami. So I called up a friend of mine who was a part owner of the Montreal Canadiens. Now we're talking, right? Ice. I said, would you do me a favor? Do you have anybody that knows how to make ice for an ice skating rink? He said, I have the greatest guy in the world. I said, could I talk to him, please? And he came to New York and he saw me. He said, this is crazy. He said, Mr. Trump, they're going to have five miles of this piping. If there's a little pinhole, because it's gas, free on gas. If there's a little pinhole in five miles, it's, it's dead. He said, you don't want that. You want rubber hose and you want water. And in the water, you put salt so it doesn't freeze. I said, boy, that sounds good. <laughs> and I went out and we bought it for just a tiny amount of money. And it was rubber hose every four inches, but it's rubber hose. We got the equipment. It's called brine. They call it brine. And we did the rubber hose. Nobody stole the rubber hose. Nobody wanted it. We didn't need, we didn't need security. Nobody stole the rubber hose. And we opened it up. And it was the most amazing thing. We put the rubber hose down. We tested it. There wasn't a leak in the whole thing. 6.2 miles of rubber hose. Can you believe it? That's a lot. That's... Uh, wasn't a leak. Now what happened is we put the concrete over. We had concrete to Harlem. Now, my, all of my construction friends in that corner, in fact, they all have the worst seats. I don't know why. Construction guys usually have the best seats. But they understand what I'm talking about. Because we wanted a contiguous pour. Because the city used to pour 10 feet, come back a week later, pour another 10 feet. And yet all these blocks got, you want a contiguous pour. We had, all the way back to Harlem, we had trucks. And the most amazing thing, and they poured. It took two days to pour the slab. We actually made it six inches, because that's better. And we turned on, and we put two inches of water on top of this slab, and they made lasers. It was such a perfect slab. To this day, it's perfect. They then put the water on top. I said, try it, because this thing hadn't had ice in nine years. I said, try it. And in two hours, we had the most beautiful ice, just like the Montreal Canadiens. And we had our room. And we had our room. So, so I've had a lot of fun with New York. And we did another job recently in the Bronx, where it was the same thing, where they had, you know, Ferry Point. They are, you know what I'm talking about. Ferry Point was under construction for 26 years. I mean, people say, give me a break. 26. The only reason I don't say 32 is because that can't be proven. 26 years. It ended up costing hundreds of millions of dollars. Nobody knows what the price is. And Michael Bloomberg said, could you do me a favor? Could you look at this? It's a disaster. It's been under construction for so many. And he was embarrassed. And it's a very big golf project designed by Jack Nicklaus and, you know, many, many iterations. But I got it built in one year. And it's open today and greatly successful. So and for peanuts, when I say open, am I right? That's the woman right there. She's probably on the... F Am I right? Thank you, darling. I appreciate it. Very nice. I don't know who the hell she is. I know she's not a protester. She's on my side. And she's certainly not a pay... I'll tell you what. 
You take a look outside. These are paid protesters, folks. They've got the most beautiful signs made from a factory. They're all printed out. They're handed. It said, if you want any information on the sign, please call this number. What kind of crap? We want, if they're real protesters, we want those signs made in the basement. <laughs> anyway. So then we've done many jobs since then, and it's just a great city. It's a vibrant city, an amazing city. We have to be careful. Our mayor has to be careful because he can blow it very quickly if he keeps going the way he's going. Not doing good. We better be careful, Mr. Mayor. But we have a city that outlasts the mayors. It outlasts everybody. It's going to outlast us. It's one of the great, great cities of the world, and it's called New White House. I said White House. I want to just talk just for a second about New York values because it's become a big thing. And I wrote, a, I wrote a few things down, but it's just one of those things. I said, you know, I talked tonight about New York values that we all, many of us, that we all know so well. The values that make us love this state, which has been a symbol of American strength throughout the world. No matter where you go, they love New York. You know, you can be from lots of other places, and if you want to see somebody, you just say, when are you coming to New York? They always come. Everybody comes to New York eventually. There's nothing like it. So when we talk about values, what do we see in New York values? We see are really, really incredible. When you look at September 11th especially, New York police and New York firefighters. Incredible. We see our unbelievable, and they keep those trains going and those buses and everything else, but we see our transit workers and what they went through on September 11th was incredible. We see families playing in Central Park. Thousands and thousands of families with their children. Some without children. Some together. Some not together. But we see people in Central Park and people playing in Central Park. We see restaurant workers all over the city, in delis, and factory workers in upstate New York. Unfortunately, I've spent a lot of time in upstate New York, and those factory workers are rapidly, rapidly leaving our state. And we can't let that happen. And we have a whole fabric of our community. So what are New York values? Because, you know, people are disputing. I'm not disputing, and the New Yorkers aren't disputing. And most people that know New York and have watched what we've done, when you look at what happened with September 11th, 
The job that this city has done and the people of this city has, have done is beyond what anyone's ever seen. And you say, what are New York values? Number one, honesty and straight talking. Honesty, you better believe. It's a work ethic. Hard-working people. It's about family. New York, believe it, is about family. So important. It's the energy to get things done. Big energy. If Jeb Bush came here, I'm telling you, he'd have much more energy than he has right now. <laughs> Tell him, he should move to New York, right? We're builders. We make things happen. It's so important. We make things happen. And it's courage and community service, because there's tremendous community service. New York values were on display for all to see in the aftermath of 9-11, a strike at the heart of our city and our nation. In our darkest moments, as a city, we showed the world the very, very best in terms of bravery and heart and soul that we have in America. The firefighters and first responders and the police officers and the Port Authority workers who ran up those stairs, those are New York values and those are New Yorker values. I'm not sure if she's serious or what. <laughs> Father Michael Judge Chaplin to the New York City Fire Department, who you know died, and an amazing guy who I knew a little bit, who a lot of people knew very well, who Rudy Giuliani really knew very well. But you look at Father Judge, and I'll tell you what, that was some guy, and he ran up there to pray, and he knew what was going to happen, and he died. And he died praying and taking care of people, and he was an amazing guy. The people in the towers who helped rescue each other, those are those of New York values. The restaurants and local businesses who kept their shops open to help everybody during this incredible time. Those are New York values. Everyone who helped clear the rubble and the rescue, the injured, those are New York values. Every small act of kindness. Every great act of courage, of which there were so many, there's never been anything like this. This was the greatest attack and the worst and most horrific attack in the history of our country. Far greater than Pearl Harbor because the attack was on civilians. It wasn't on the military. It was on civilians. But those are New York values. And these are the values that we need to make America great again. We need these values to bring America together again, and to heal America's wounds again. So, I just want to tell you that I am so proud to be with you tonight. I am so proud to be discussing all sorts of topics, but most importantly, New York values. Because no matter where you go, anywhere in the world, they talk in the most positive tones about what all of us have done. So, ladies and gentlemen, have a great dinner. We're going to have an amazing election coming up. We're having some really great primaries. It's been a lot of fun for me. You know, what's it supposed to be this way? A lot of people said, well, what do you know? I've been dealing with politicians all my life, so I think I know something. But it's been a, a great, great experience. I'm right now millions of votes ahead of my closest rival. Millions of votes. You know, people don't talk about votes anymore. They talk delegates. Uh, by the way, I happen to be hundreds of delegates ahead, too. But I'm, you know, to me, so important. I'm millions of votes ahead of my next mayor's vote. And we have, thank you, thank you, Doug. Millions of votes. We have 22 states. 22 states. And it started, by the way, with New Hampshire. We went down to South Carolina. States that I wasn't supposed to win. And I ended up winning in a landslide. Alabama, Arkansas, Kentucky. The South, I may move to the South if New York doesn't treat us well. Because I'll tell you, the South has been so great to me. And then we went to Florida where, you know, it's my second home. This is my first home. It's my second home. 
And we did so unbelievably, won in a landslide by 20 points. And it was an absolute landslide. And now we have something happening that's going to be very exciting. The next four or five weeks are going to be very exciting. And we start, we'll bring it home. Thank you. Thank you. Man. And we start on Tuesday. So big. And you know, the interesting thing is with all the primaries that we've been through, years and years and years of primary, sort of either over or not very important by the time they get to New York, right? New York is so important. It's so important. Like New York should be so important. And I see what's happening and I see the polls coming in and I'm so honored because the people that know me best are the people from New York. They're the ones that really know me. So when I'm up 42 points, I said 42 points, that's a lot. But when I'm up 42 and 44 points in the newest polls, that's such an honor because those are the people that know me best. So I think we're going to have a really exciting next four or five weeks. I think we're going to have a great time in Cleveland, hopefully not too good a time because by that time, it should be solved by the time we get there, okay? And enjoy the hotel. Enjoy this great, great city. And it's an honor to be with you tonight. Thank you very much, everybody.